And we're kicking off this list with the Attack of the Dead Men. Now, I learned about this from a song by Sabaton, awesome band, definitely check them out. But it's based on a real life battle that took place between the Germans and the Russians in World War One. On August 6th, 1915, the Germans had unleashed a barrage of poison gases on the enemy before beginning their advance. They didn't think they were going to come up against much resistance if any at all, but they were wrong. From the smoke and ashes came several Russian survivors. They were coughing up blood and bits of their own lungs. Their skin had begun to decay. They looked like reanimated corpses. And the Germans immediately turned around and just booked it back where they came. They were so frightened that some of them became entangled in their own barbed wire traps. And the Russians started opening fire on the fleeing soldiers. World War I just sounded like literal hell on earth. And the Germans on that day probably thought they were actually seeing the dead come to life. Pretty horrifying. Number 9, Destinies of the Soul. I thought uh, it was only evil books like the legendary Necronomicon that were supposedly bound in human flesh. But it turns out that this was a more common practice than you might think. Destinies of the Soul, published at some point in the 1880s, is just one of the many books that were bound in human skin back in the good old days. And where does this book sit now? Harvard. It's, it's been there since some point in the 1930s. Bound with human skin by Dr. Boland, who wrote on the inside stating, This book is bound in human skin parchment on which no ornament has been stamped to preserve its elegance. By looking carefully, you easily distinguish the pores of the skin. A book about the human soul deserved to have a human covering. I kept this piece of human skin taken from the back of a woman. It is interesting to see the different aspects that change this skin according to the method of preparation to which it is subjected. The practice of binding books this way, it was known as something I can't pronounce. Look it up there. Maybe we'll just write it. I'm not going to bother. It's going to take hours. Uh, anyway, it dates back to the 16th century. Next up, we have the Champawat Tiger. In the late 19th to early 20th century, this tigress was responsible for the deaths of an estimated 436 people in Nepal and the Kalman area of India. And that's a single-handedly, mind you. This tiger was basically the real-life version of Sher Khan. At the time, her natural habitat was being destroyed to make way for farmland and timber, and many of its natural food sources were being hunted by humans in large numbers. So food was a bit scarce. And in response, the tiger decided to just uh, eat humans. And it did. Now, tigers don't often hunt down humans and eat them. But in this case, uh, she didn't really have much choice. In 1907, the rogue tiger was finally shot by Jim Corbett, an Indian-born British hunter and tracker. This tiger wasn't the only one he hunted down either. He was a colonel in the British Indian Army and was often called upon to track and slay man-eating tigers and leopards, but none were as tough as the Champawat tiger who holds the record for the highest human death toll of any single animal. Next up on the list is Terreri. Ter Terreri. He was a guy from France in the late 1700s who became famous or infamous for his super disturbing eating habits. He had this crazy appetite and would eat tons of food, even live animals. He'd, he'd gobble down a whole bunch of apples, a meal meant for like for 15 people. He'd even take to devouring cats and dogs. Terrari uh, didn't stop at regular food though. He once ate a live eel whole and even swallowed a snake after taking off its skin. Doctors and curious people began taking note of him trying to figure out like why he ate like he did. They thought something might be wrong with his stomach that made him feel full or and, and just never gain weight. At one point, he was hospitalized, and his disturbing behavior just got worse. He was once found eating parts of corpses and drinking human blood. The mystery was never completely solved, and he eventually passed away when he was 26. And at number six, we have Ancient Teeth Whitener. Now, this one's just kind of gross, but if you're looking to whiten your teeth and you're on a budget, could be worth a try. Just don't say I recommended it because I am not. So uh, the Romans used to use urine to whiten their teeth. Uh, they dilute it with water or goat's milk and uh, I don't know, I guess wish it around like mouthwash. The thing, it's just, it's as nasty as it sounds. It, it did apparently work. There is ammonia in urine which acts as a cleansing agent. You can find ammonia in cleaning products like glass cleaner for example nowadays. Now I'm not sure what they would have done about their breath. Not much point in having pearly white teeth if you smell like number one. I also 
it's kind of weird to think that if you saw someone back then with a nice set of exceptionally bright white teeth in their mouth, you'd think like, man, that dude swishes a lot of pee. Were people like grossed out back then too? Were they like, oh, here we go, here we go again. Gotta whiten these teeth. Things I do for these chompas. Or were they just really casual about it? I'm starting to realize why this fact wasn't brought up in school. First of all, you'd never be able to get the class under control. You know, some kid would try it as a dare. The parents would be like, what are you teaching our kids? It would be a whole thing. Number five, the headless chicken. This whole incident began in 1945 in Colorado. A farmer named Lloyd Olson tried to lob off the head of one of his chickens because it was time for dinner and his wife was going to prepare a meal for his mother-in-law. Most of the head came off, but he missed the jugular and most of its brain stem was still intact. He attempted to prep the chicken for dinner, but it was still alive. So instead of trying again, he decided to just take care of it. He used an eyedropper to give it water and would feed it small bits of corn and grains. But this day would change the course of both the Olsen family and the chicken forever, as this headless bird would soon skyrocket to fame, becoming known as Mike the Headless Chicken. Together they toured the US with Mike being showcased in freak shows and circus sideshows, which I think are pretty much the same thing. He was photographed for magazines. Everyone wanted to meet Mike the Headless Chicken. Chicks wanted his autograph. He was a sensation for 18 whole months before finally dying in 1947. The Blood Eagle. So this was a form of punishment carried out by Vikings and it's pretty brutal. The Blood Eagle was a practice used on particularly bad enemies, traitors, or those who were deemed dishonorable. The recipient of this lovely procedure was restrained laying face down on the ground. On their back they would have the image of an eagle with its wings spread out carved into them. Then the victim's ribs were separated from the spine and kind of splayed out so in the end they'd almost have this appearance of wings coming out of their back. And finally the lungs would be pulled out and like splayed over the ribs which would kind of flutter in the wind like the wings of a majestic eagle. What a, what a cool party trick. Sounds like a fun time to be alive. Next on the list we have the tapeworm diet. This was a bizarre weight loss method popular in the early 20th century which involved intentionally ingesting a tapeworm in the hopes of shedding weight. Uh, advertisements claim that the tapeworms would consume a portion of the food in the digestive tract leading to weight loss without altering one's eating habits. Some people looking to lose weight could purchase tapeworm cysts usually in the form of a pill from dubious sources. Once ingested the tapeworms would grow and absorb nutrients from the host's Food. As they matured, the tapeworms would reach several feet in length. Weight loss was just a side effect of malnutrition and the bodies like struggle to absorb nutrients effectively due to, you know, having a tapeworm in their stomach. This was obviously incredibly dangerous. There were complications including abdominal pain and worse stuff. In some cases, of course, life-threatening conditions if the parasites migrated to other parts of the body especially. And the tapeworms couldn't really be controlled or like selectively removed once inside the body. And eventually, medical professionals stepped in and began to denounce the tapeworm diet as very risky and ineffective. And eventually, the sale of tapeworm products uh, started to decline, thankfully. Number two, buried alive. Now, this is one a lot of you may know about already, but people used to get buried alive a lot and not always on purpose. The, this macabre occurrence stemmed from a lack of medical understanding and limited technology. The 18th century saw a, especially a rise in cases of mistaken death due to various factors like certain illnesses, accidents, comas especially. Medical professionals of the era really struggled to accurately determine whether someone was actually dead or not, leading to premature burials. Graveyards became the uh, unintended scenes of horror as unfortunate folks were laid to rest before they were actually dead. The fear of being buried alive was a very real concern in society at that time, which led to the invention of various safety measures to prevent people from dying in their graves, which is an odd sentence to say. Some coffins were fitted with bells or strings attached to the deceased's finger, which would be pulled from above ground in case they woke up. Then hopefully a gravedigger would hear the bell and race over to uh, dig the person out. And coming in at number one, we have mummy medicine. Mummy medicine was practiced 
for hundreds of years and involved using ground up mummy remains in medical remedies. Uh, European apothecaries believed that powdered mummy could cure various ailments due to its perceived mystical and restorative properties. The main source of these mummies was of course Egypt where preserved corpses were plentiful due to natural dehydration in the uh, dry climate. Mummies were ground into powder and added to medical concoctions believed to treat conditions ranging from epilepsy, stomach disorders, and the demand for mummies was so high that sometimes led to the deliberate plundering of ancient Egyptian tombs. And despite this widespread use, mummy medicine lacked any real scientific basis and over time as medical understanding improved the practice fell out of favor. And we're starting things off with a, a weird one. Did you know that there is one instance of a person winning a race after they died? Frank Hayes was a horse trainer and jockey who in 1923 entered a race at Belmont Park Racetrack in New York. The horse was named Sweet Kiss but got a new nickname after the race was over. The Sweet Kiss of Death and it never raced again and that's because midway through the race Frank Hayes suffered a heart attack and died on his horse. But Sweet Kiss crossed the finish line and won the race. The folks went down to congratulate him, and that's when they noticed his body was slumped over. He was pronounced dead almost immediately. Hayes had been under tremendous pressure to cut weight for the race. Supposedly, he'd gone from 142 pounds to 130 in a very short span of time. Some articles even say he'd lost the weight in just 24 hours. I don't think that's possible. But regardless, he definitely lost it far faster than he should have. And number nine, we have helium. Apparently, Earth is running out of it. This is a bit of an issue because helium has a big role in various technologies. There's a growing demand for helium. It's used in MRI scanners, semiconductor manufacturing, and scientific research, and, and we're using it faster than it can be extracted. Helium is actually abundant in the universe, but it escapes Earth's atmosphere due to its lightness and uh, just migrates into space. As a result, our supply here on Earth is finite and non-renewable. Right now, researchers are exploring methods of helium production, like capturing it from the atmosphere, although that process is pretty costly and pretty challenging. I used to get really freaked out by stuff like this, but I don't know, now I'm just like, what am I supposed to do about it? Number eight, tersoriums. What is a torsorium, you ask? Well, this was a tool used in ancient Rome. He had a stick with a sea sponge on the end, looking a lot like a toilet brush. But these weren't used to clean inanimate objects. These were used to clean the rear end, basically toilet paper before toilet paper uh, existed. Now, this doesn't sound all that gross at first. Nothing wrong with using a sponge to clean your butt. But when you consider the fact that these things were shared in public restrooms, yeah, that's pretty revolting. Now, it would be dunked in a barrel of water and vinegar afterwards to clean it off, but I mean, still, not sure how effective that would really be. And even if it was, let's just say that vinegar cleansed the thing completely. Just the idea, the principle alone, of scrubbing your butt with something that who knows who else also used to scrub theirs. I don't care how supposedly clean it is. That should be for personal use only. I mean, just like your everyday loofah. All you do is scrub your body with that thing, parts of your body that are far more clean than back there, uh, and I still only want to use mine. So the idea of this uh, makes me sick. Let's stick around in ancient Rome for a bit, talking about their cure for epilepsy. Gladiator blood. Uh, it's pretty well known that gladiators were seen as these larger than life heroic figures, almost like superheroes of the time. And without any concrete medical understanding of epilepsy, it was believed that the life juice of a fallen gladiator would be drunk by someone suffering from the mysterious disorder to help cure them of it. This was most likely because gladiators were very strong and healthy, so drinking their red stuff uh, was believed to maybe be a bit of an elixir, consuming their life force to gain some of the strength that they had in life. Sometimes the gladiator's liver would be eaten too. Now, of course, this didn't actually work. I'm not sure how long this practice went on before they would have realized that, but maybe there was a bit of a ceremonial aspect to it as well. This one is pretty gross, but not all that shocking, to be honest. Like, who wouldn't want to consume parts of a super elite sports hero when they die brutally right in front of your eyes, right? We all wish we could do that. Number six. Genghis Khan. Uh, Genghis Khan helped the environment. Uh, ruling from 1206 to 1227, founded the Mongol Empire through conquests across Asia and Europe. His leadership united nomadic tribes 
and created a pretty vast empire stretching from China to Eastern Europe, who's absolutely brutal, responsible for the deaths of an estimated 40 million people, according to a study by the Carnegie Institution for Science Departments of Global Energy. He and his army's destructive massacres were so significant that they may have actually reduced the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. This is because areas used for farmland or land that was once populated by people was allowed to grow back into lush forests, eliminating carbon by 700 million tons from the atmosphere. Now, did Genghis Khan do this intentionally? Of course not, but it just goes to show that even when things look completely dark and messed up, I don't know, sometimes there's a bit of good that can come from it, I guess. And at number five, we have the Dancing Plague. The Dancing Plague of 1518 is a very bizarre event that occurred in Strasbourg, France. During the summer of that year, a woman known as Frau Trophy began dancing uncontrollably in the streets. She just wouldn't stop, and within days, other people started to like join in and eventually formed into this mass of dancers. This event lasted for weeks, with a number of participants growing to several hundred, and the dancers experienced exhaustion, dehydration, and some even died. Doctors were pretty puzzled by the situation, but determined it was caused by overheated blood and just sanctioned public areas for dancing to relieve the affected individuals. Nowadays, this is known as one of the most notorious cases of mass hysteria in history, an instance of mass psychogenic illness where uh, some kind of psychological trigger leads to physical symptoms in a large group of people at once. But even till this day, no definitive explanation has been reached as to how this started and what was really going on here. The story has always given me the creeps, though. I wonder what I would do in this situation, right? Would I just look at them all dancing and scratch my head and then continue on with my day? Or would I become afflicted and join in? That's the, that's the question. Number four, the Great Emu War. The American Civil War, World War I, World War II, Vietnam. We've all heard of these and many more famous wars from throughout history, but there's one that doesn't get mentioned all that much, but played a significant role in the history of Australia, the Great Emu War. Yes, the Australian population raged a war with these flightless birds, and spoiler alert, they lost. The unusual event took place in Australia during 1932, following World War I, soldiers were given land in Western Australia to start to farm, but because of economic hardships, many of these farmers found themselves struggling, faced with crop destruction and land degradation caused by large populations of emus. The farmers requested assistance from the government, and in response, the government deployed soldiers armed with machine guns to help curb the emu population, and the war commenced in November of 1932, but proved to be more challenging than anticipated. The emus were quick and agile, and the soldiers found it difficult to get rid of them. After weeks of this intense warfare, the government decided to just withdraw the troops. The emus survived the war relatively unscathed, and the campaign was deemed a complete failure. In at number three, we have the Green Children of Woolpit. This is a very bizarre tale. I, I'd never heard of this one before, and it was kind of a fun thing to read up on. The Green Children of Woolpit is a medieval legend that originated in the village of Woolpit, England during the 12th century. The story revolves around these two very odd young siblings, a brother and sister, who appeared in the village and, and they had green skin. They spoke in an unfamiliar language and wore strange clothing that the villagers weren't familiar with. They refused to eat food offered to them at first, but over time they started to adapt to their new environment and their skin gradually lost its green hue. They learned English and explained that they had come from a subterranean world where the sun never shined and everyone had green skin. They'd been uh, looking after their father's cattle, apparently, when they heard a loud noise and then suddenly found themselves in wool pit. And the brother eventually fell ill and died. Uh, the girl thrived, though, and went on to marry a man from the village and started a family. Uh, so where do you even start with a story like this? There are a lot of questions and only hypotheses about what actually happened here. One explanation is that the youngsters could have had some kind of condition that turned their skin green, right? Uh, perhaps they were migrants who were abandoned by their family and their language just wasn't known at the time. Of course, there are more outlandish theories though, like maybe they were from some long lost civilization that really did live underground. Some even speculate that they could have been an alien species from an alternate 
dimension. I mean, you, you know, just go nuts. Fun ideas, obviously there's nothing to really back that up. So all we know is that it's a very strange story from a very long time ago. And at number two, we have a type of fish with human looking teeth. So take a look at this. Uh, yeah, that's, that's real. Someone didn't just put a set of dentures into a regular fish's mouth as a joke. This is a sheep shed fish. It uses those teeth to chomp down on the shells of the creatures it eats, like mussels and barnacles and oysters. It's definitely unsettling to look at. It reminds me of that picture that's floated around online for ages with the, uh, the teddy bear with the human teeth or the smiling dog that looks like it has uh, human teeth. It's just uncomfortable to look at. Don't like it. Finally, at our number one spot, we have the zombie ant fungus. Now, this is all gonna sound like something from a 1950s sci-fi monster movie, but it is very much real. There is a fungus called Ophiocordyceps unilateralis. It is known to invade the bodies of ants, basically turning them into mindless zombies. When infected with a spore, the ant will start to behave strangely. Eventually, they'll be compelled to leave their nest and climb onto a plant stem. And then they'll ascend to the perfect height where there's the right humidity for the fungus to continue to grow. And the ant will cling to a leaf and remain there until a long stalk starts growing out of its head. And inside of this stalk are more spores, spores that will be released and rain down on the uninfected ants below, infecting them with the fungus too, and on and on it goes. Life as an insect sounds absolutely horrifying. Not only are you under constant threat of massive sized predators, but you also have to worry about a fungus that can grow inside your body and take over your brain? No thank you. Number 10, carbon dioxide went down due to so many deaths. Genghis Khan was a founder and first Kaugan of the Mongol Empire, which later became the largest adjoining land empire in history. Having spent the majority of his life uniting the Mongol tribes, he launched a series of military campaigns which conquered large parts of China and Central Asia. In the 13th century, he ended the lives of so many many peasants that the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere were significantly reduced as a result. During his 21 year reign, his destructive armies were responsible for the deaths of up to 40 million people. With so many people gone and nobody left to farm the lands owned by the peasants, nature went back to its true form and grew back into carbon absorbing forests. It's estimated that 700 tons of carbon were wiped from the atmosphere, which to put in perspective is around the same amount of carbon dioxide generated in a year through global gasoline consumption. Now before we continue on, I have a question for all of you watching. Do you ever get tired of those same old boring games from the app store? Well, look no further, because I have just the game for you. It's called Raid Shadow Legends and it's honestly the best. It's completely free to download and there's already millions of users. It has amazing graphics and there's billions of ways to customize and build your champions as there's endless content. Now I'm sure you've all heard the hypothetical question, which four historical people would you invite to a dinner party? Well, if I could choose four characters from Raid to have dinner with, I'd choose Aethel, Sniper, Archer, and Fireblade. They are four strong female characters who are tough, and I'd love to get some battle tips from them. Plus, they have awesome names. And if Sniper could teach me how to use her bow and arrow, that would be pretty cool in my opinion. Who would you bring? Let me know in the comments down below. But that's not all. Raid's fourth anniversary is here and there's a ton to get excited about. I'm talking dedicated offers, gifts, promo codes, events, and a brand new fusion event where you guys can get your hands on the anniversary themed legendary champion. But wait, there's more. With all this exciting stuff and more coming to Raid, if you haven't started playing yet, then what are you waiting for? For new users only, you can use our link in the description or scan our QR code to get insane bonuses. We're talking an epic champion Kellen the Strike and other useful things. And since it's Raid's birthday, the gifts keep coming. All new and existing players can get a bunch of free birthday gifts. Once you're in game after clicking the links, just enter promo code 4 years Raid to get your hands on four legendary skill tomes plus other useful stuff. Simple. So 
make sure to download Raid Shadow Legends and let's get on with the video. Number 9. Dentures were made from the dead. Dentures were a pretty big deal among the upper classes in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Typically high sugar diets combined with early attempts at teeth whitening, which wore away tooth enamel instead of brightening it, meant that their teeth were bad. So people would get dentures. But how did they make dentures back then? The easiest and most profitable way to acquire human teeth for dentures was to take them from the dead. Yep, they would take dead people's teeth and use them as their own teeth. The battlefield at Waterloo presented thousands of recently dead soldiers whose teeth were unfortunately perfect for taking. I mean, reduce, reuse, recycle, right? But I think I'd rather have no teeth than have dentures made of someone else's teeth. Number 8. Human Zoos Yes, you heard that right. There were zoos and instead of animals, which some people are already against, they were filled with people. Like human beings of all genders and ages. Human zoos were public displays of people, usually in so-called natural or primitive states. They were most prominent during the 19th and 20th centuries, and in the 1870s, exhibitions of so-called exotic populations became popular throughout the Western world. Human zoos could be seen in many of Europe's largest cities, such as Paris, Hamburg, London, Milan, as well as American cities such as New York City and Chicago. They began as part of circuses and freak shows, and in the Western Hemisphere, one of the earliest known zoos, that in Mexico, consisted not only of a vast collection of animals, but also dwarves, albinos, and hunchbacks. This wasn't all though, as the dissection and display of bodies after their death without consent was also shown. Throughout their existence, such exhibitions garnered controversy over their demeaning, derogatory, and dehumanizing nature. Thankfully, the last human zoo on record was at the World's Fair in Brussels in 1958, which isn't even that long ago. Which is insane to me. Number seven, Magdalene Asylums. I hope I'm saying that right. Magdalene Asylums, also known as Magdalene Laundries, were Roman Catholic institutions that operated from the 18th to the late 20th centuries to house fallen women. The term referred to female sexual promiscuity or work in prostitution, young women who became pregnant outside of marriage, or young girls and teenagers who did not have familial support. They were required to work without pay apart from food provisions. Many of these laundries laundries were effectively operated as penitentiary workhouses. The strict regimes in the institutions were often more severe than those found in prisons. Now this contradicted the perceived outlook that they were meant to help women as opposed to punishing them, but let's be honest, they were just punishing them. These places operated in the United Kingdom, Ireland, Sweden, Canada, and the United States, and Australia for much of the 19th and well into the 20th century, with the last one closing in 1996, which isn't that long ago. A survivor said of the working conditions, the heat was unbelievable, you couldn't leave your station unless a bell went. Now that definitely sounds more like a punishment, and I don't understand how this could happen. Number 6. The Schoolhouse Blizzard The Schoolhouse Blizzard hit the US Plain States on January 12, 1888. The blizzard came unexpectedly on a relatively warm day, and most people were not dressed properly. Many people went out without coats and even short sleeved shirts. What made the storm so deadly was the timing, as it was during work and school hours. The very strong wind fields behind the cold front and the powdery snow reduced visibilities on the open plains to zero, which is terrifying. People ventured from the safety of their homes to do chores, go to town, attend school, or simply enjoy the warm day. The weather changed so fast though and people weren't prepared for it, and as a result, thousands of people got caught in the blizzard. They got lost in the darkness and the snow and the wind, and many froze in their town just yards away from houses or other sources of refuge. The death toll was 235, though some estimate 1,000. Now I know I complain about Canadian winter and snowstorms, but this is definitely worse. Number 5. Human Remains in Medicine Human remains were a common ingredient in medicine until the 20th century, which again is disgusting to me. The remains were most commonly ground up into fine powder that could be made into pills or stirred into drinks. People thought that ingesting a certain part of the body Body would help cure illnesses in that part of their own. For example, crushed skull powder was believed to cure headaches. Now I am so glad that our science has advanced past that because I cannot imagine ingesting something from another human. Now due to this, mummy remains were particularly valued as remedies. In fact, there are so few mummies these days precisely because of this high demand for human flesh at the time. Ew. <laughs> 
Number four, the AIDS epidemic. The AIDS epidemic caused by HIV found its way to the United States between the 1970s and 1980s. During the HIV slash AIDS epidemic of the 1880s, LGBTQ communities were further stigmatized as they became the focus of mass hysteria, suffered isolation and marginalization, and were targeted with extreme acts of violence in the United States. One of the best known works on the history of HIV and AIDS is the 1987 book and the band played on by Randy Schultz who claimed that Ronald Reagan's administration dragged its feet in dealing with the crisis due to homophobia, while the gay community viewed early reports and public health measures with corresponding distrust, thus allowing the disease to spread further and infect hundreds of thousands more. US leaders had remained largely silent and unresponsive to the health emergency, and it wasn't until September 1985, four years after the crisis began, that President Ronald Reagan first publicly mentioned AIDS. If Reagan took steps four years earlier, earlier to help and wasn't so homophobic, many, many, many lives would have been saved, but he ignored it. As of 2018, 700,000 people have died of HIV slash AIDS in the United States since the beginning of the epidemic, and nearly 13,000 people with AIDS in the United States die each year. Number three residential schools. Now many people think that Canada is all sunshine and rainbows, but we actually have our own dark past. In Canada, the Indian residential school system was a network of boarding schools for indigenous peoples. The network was funded by the Canadian government's Department of Indian Affairs and administrated by Christian churches. The school system was created to isolate indigenous children from the influence of their own culture and religion in order to assimilate them into the dominant Canadian culture. Over the course of the system's more than 100 years existence, around 150,000 children were placed in residential schools nationally. The residential school system harmed indigenous children significantly by removing them from their families, depriving them of their ancestral languages, and mistreating them both physically and mentally. Conditions in the schools led to student malnutrition, starvation, and disease. The legacy of the system has been linked to an increased prevalence of post-traumatic stress, alcoholism, use of illegal substances, and generational trauma trauma in indigenous peoples. The number of school related deaths remains unknown due to incomplete records, but estimates range from 3,000 to 200 to over 30,000, and there are thousands of unmarked graves of the poor students. Number 2. Mountain Peel In the late 1890s and early 1900s, St. Pierre Marnique was known as a beautiful town, but there was darkness looming over it, a volcano. Citizens of the area were so used to the volcanic activity that no one took it seriously when the fresh steaming vent holes and earth tremors started during April 1902. Then minor explosions began at the summit of the volcano, ash began to rain down continuously, and the nauseating stench of sulfur filled the air. Even worse, more than a hundred snakes slithered down and invaded the town. Yeah, snakes. And they ended the lives of 50 people. Then on May 5th, a landslide of boiling mud and water from the Etang Sec Crater Lake spilled into the River Blanche and 23 workmen died. This was followed by a tsunami that ended the lives of hundreds of people. This naturally caused concern in the town and many wanted to leave. I'm sorry, but people stayed through all of that and decided to stay, even after the whole snake situation. Then. Three days later, May 8th, Mount Peely finally exploded, sending an avalanche of white hot lava straight towards the town. Within three minutes, St. Pierre was completely destroyed, and of its 30,000 population, there were only two people who survived. And coming in at number one is the Dancing Plague. In 1518, the city of Strasbourg was hit by a dancing plague where people would dance uncontrollably for days at a time. It began with a single woman dancing solo for a few days before eventually more more and more people became affected. Doctors proclaimed that the illness was caused by overheated blood and recommended that the inflicted should continue to shimmy and sway the fever away. I mean, musicians were even called in and a stage was set up in the town center to give the dancers more room. While the idea may seem funny at first, most of them kept dancing till they fell unconscious and some died from exhaustion, heart attack, or stroke. Number 10. Poison. Somebody literally poisoned the water hole this time around. The Prohibition era was a time where there were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which was done so with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, another Asian, you name it. Anything that has to do with alcohol, 
no go. This was all banned by the US government from 1920 to 1933. It's a, it's a long time with their twisted teas. Now, of course, this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol, obviously. It was just done so in sneakier ways, right? Come in my basement. I got some, I got some, yeah, drink this. I don't know, whatever. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead of what they were getting before, which, I mean, as I said it, I'm like, this doesn't sound nice, does it? I'm not thirsty saying this out loud. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing is not. Something that the government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. It was, uh, they literally poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. Like, that's, yeah. And not just poison in a way where the consumer would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this alone. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. Cut to today, well, more and more things are now legal, so a little different in these 20s. Number nine, the man in the green hat. Congress had their own personal bootlegger. How nice must that have been? He was known as the man in the green hat. His name was George L. Cassidy. This was probably the weirdest job in history. It's, it, it's up there. Cassidy's nine to five was to walk through the halls of Congress, making up to 30 deliveries of illegal booze every single day. All the while, Capitol Police just watched. Yeah, he could come and go at any time. In over five years, he supplied bottles of whiskey, moonshine, scotch, bourbon, gin, you name it. He'd carry all of this in a briefcase. Yeah, so he couldn't have looked more official with his hat and his briefcase. He's going to work. This guy's nine to five. He's busy. His politician friends eventually got him his own room, his own office to work out of in the house office building. In 1925, he was sadly arrested while ferreting six quarts of whiskey to a house member. He had with him that day a light green hat on, and from then on, he's been referred to as the man in the green hat. Yeah, he was busted. He was busted that sad day. Damn. Don't snitch. Somebody definitely snitched on him, eh? They're like green hat. Looks like the Riddler. He's got a Pabst blue ribbon in his briefcase. Get him. Number eight, not an experiment. Okay, hopefully this clears some things up a bit here, but President Herbert Hoover, he never referred to prohibition as a noble experiment. That is a, that's misquoted. That's not the case. That would be an odd thing to experiment, but that's what many believe here. See, growing up, many books and articles on prohibition have quoted President Herbert Hoover describing prohibition as a noble experiment, but even Hoover himself had to get in on this game of broken telephone. Clear some things up a bit. That's a bad quote, especially given the lives lost during this time. Everything's got to be not misquoted at all. Hoover himself reminds us, he assures us that he was a supporter of prohibition, but he actually campaigned for it in 1928. Afterwards, he made a statement at the Republican National Convention saying that our country has deliberately undertaken a great social and economic experiment, noble in motive and far-reaching in purpose. That's the quote, end quote, boom. But years later, Hoover said he was misunderstood. He says the phrase, a great social experiment, noble in motive, was distorted into one thing. It was distorted into a noble experiment, which of course was not at all what he said or not at all what it was. So quit spreading those lies, all right? Let's end this 1928 mix up once and for all. A hundred years later, we're like, oh, Sorry. <laughs> Number seven, World War One. When the United States entered World War One in 1917, prohibition hadn't taken off quite yet. It was close, but still a few things to sign. What really turned the tides were experts coming out and arguing that the barley being used to brew beer could actually be made into bread to feed American soldiers. And then from that point on, I mean, it's kind of hard to argue that, right? You're like, well, okay. Fine then. The war actually allowed some individuals to paint America's German brewing industry as a threat. Yeah, that massive industry. They're like, what are these guys doing? Politicians would label Pabst and Miller as treacherous and menacing, saying there's German enemies right here at home. Yeah, German enemies, and they come in six packs. Heads up. Number six, not every state. We see this now being a Canadian, at least I see this. We're seeing certain things become legal all of a sudden. And it's weird, especially when just a few hours south from where I am right now, there are thousands and thousands of people being incarcerated for having something that at the same time is legal or decriminalized up here. You know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying. It's odd, but we saw this happen in prohibition as well. Many governors at the time refused to throw any money towards enforcing or policing the alcohol ban. Maryland, for example. Okay, Maryland never even enacted an enforcement code in the first place and eventually earned a reputation as the most stubbornly anti-prohibition states in the Union. It's not bad, it's pretty cool. New York followed and repealed its measures in 1923 and then slowly but surely it all went away. Therefore, cheers. Nice. That first state was like, you know what? 
No. <laughs> Number five, Al Capone's brother. Oh man, sometimes siblings can be the exact same. My brother and I, we're practically the same person. We love all the same things, same hobbies, same parents, weirdly enough. What a coincidence is that? Al Capone and his brother? Not so close, it seems. A little different. I don't know. On, on paper, historically, they went uh, like this. Al Capone's oldest brother was a prohibition enforcement agent. Yeah, take that in. Al built a criminal empire built on illegal liquor in Chicago in the 1920s, and Vincenzo, the eldest of the six Capone brothers, he had changed his name to Richard Joseph Hart to hide his identity, and after working at the circus for a bit, because why not, Vincenzo settled in Homer, Nebraska in 1922, but eventually he became a special officer, and eventually he was assigned to investigate bootlegging. He's like, oh, do I have to? Come on. After he lost his badge on suspicion of theft, Vincenzo reunited with the Capone family in 1940, he met up with Al again in Miami, and started to get in on that family cash, finally. Number four, the boring 20s. When we think of the roaring 20s, we think champagne everywhere, funny music, people dancing like this, good times, whatever. It wasn't always like that, all right? This wasn't the great Gatsby, this was the 1920s. And according to a study conducted by Boston University economists in the early 1990s, alcohol consumption actually fell by 70% during the early years of prohibition. The levels jumped significantly in the late 20s, sure, but even so, they remained 30% lower than their pre-prohibition levels for years after the 21st Amendment was passed. So it took some time. It took some time for people to, uh, you know, get used to it again, if I can say that. Number three, still going. So I was talking about how some places, some states, they didn't enforce this experiment while others did. Well, again, even today, some are still on board and some are still in the 1920s, it seems. The other, the, the fun 20s. Some states maintained a ban on alcohol within their own borders. Even today, they still do it. Yeah, not a fun place to go. Kansas and Oklahoma remained dry until 1948 and 1959, and Mississippi remained alcohol free until 1966. That's 33 years after the passing of the 21st Amendment. Like, guy, can we click refresh? There's some, there's some new things going on behind the scenes. I'd love a beverage, please. It's been 33 years. I'm so thirsty. To this day, 10 states still contain counties where alcohol sales are still prohibited. Yeah, go find them and click the no tip option. And be like. Here you go. Cheers. No receipt for me. I'm good. Number two, new wine. Okay, fine. You want to ban alcohol? Well, we'll just make it ourselves. We'll use our own feet and stomp on some grapes. I know you do that at some point, so yeah, I'm onto something here. A great amount of low-key small distilleries and breweries continued to operate in secret during Prohibition. But if you weren't operating in the shadows, you had to either shut your doors or find new uses for these massive factories. For example, Bush, they refitted their breweries to make ice cream. And Coors, they went down the pottery and ceramics route. Yeah, can I get a tall boy of mint chocolate? Nice, thanks. Tip option for sure on that one. Two scoops, of course. Of course. Now I want chocolate, damn. And finally, number one, grandpa's medicine. Okay, we'll end on this one. The Volstead Act had a few hidden gems in it, okay? You gotta read very closely. There were some exceptions to the ban on distributing alcohol. Like today, we have medicinal purposes for everything. First, of course, right? The same for alcohol. Oh, alcohol helps my anxiety. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sacramental wine was still permitted for religious purposes, and drugstores were allowed to sell medicinal whiskey to treat toothaches and the flu. So you already know, hundreds of people just randomly showed up, lied about their tooth hurting just to get their drink on. One pint of hard liquor every three days. Plan accordingly. There you go, good luck. Pick one movie and then just go, go for it, I guess. Take three ounces every hour until stimulated. Got it, say no more, doc, thank you. Many speakeasies eventually started to disguise themselves as pharmacies. Meanwhile, actual pharmacies were lost in the dust. Some poor fellow's like, no, my tooth actually hurts, bro. I swear it actually hurts. I'm not like one of those guys, or am I? I'll never tell. Starting us off at number 10 is divorce. While today you can pretty much get a divorce for, well, really any reason you want, that wasn't always the case. In fact, prior to being able to file over irreconcilable differences like most couples do now, pretty much only men were allowed to divorce their wives, not the other way around. Unless that is, the wife could prove her husband's impotence. As it was seen as a woman's legal duty to bestow a child to her husband, if he couldn't give her the goods per se, she could file for an annulment of the marriage. But how did the court go about proving this, you ask? Well, of course 
course they couldn't just take the woman's word for it, so they would bring in a witness, usually a sex worker, to try and arouse the man. That or the court would enter your marital bedroom and well, you know, see for themselves just how well the man could get the job done. If he did in fact have any issues completing his manly duties, the woman could be freed of the marriage. Just be careful they don't accuse you of becoming a witch. Next up at number 9 is man made fertilizer. The Battle of Waterloo in 1815 resulted in the death of an estimated 60,000 soldiers, but not many of these bones have ever been recovered. And the reason why is pretty grim. In a strange, twisted series of events, the English decided to clear the field of the corpses and put the bones to use in a rather effective, but albeit creepy way. Newspapers of the time reported that the fallen French army were ground up in Yorkshire factories and the bone dust was added to their manure. Apparently the oil from the marrow proved especially helpful in the grave robbing turned fertilizer plan, and the fertilizer was purchased by farmers across England and scattered widely to help grow their crops. Meaning that an entire generation of England ate food made possible with the help of dead French soldiers. Coming in at number 8 is Ching Shi Huang. Before the understanding of modern science, there was a lot of ideas about elixirs and remedies that have quite literally no logic to back them up. Now of course it wasn't their fault, they truthfully didn't know any better. But looking back, that doesn't make it any less wild. The first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, was one of the many intent on finding the elixir of immortality, and so he demanded his royal doctors find this magical potion for him, otherwise he would have them killed. I mean just real low stakes stuff. Eventually, likely under the duress of not wanting to be killed, and also probably not knowing what they were doing, they offered him a magic potion that they promised would bring him eternal life. The magic potion, however, was actually just mercury, and the emperor ended up dying from poisoning himself. A bit ironic that in the pursuit of eternal life, he actually only made his life shorter. Coming in at number 7 is Henry Rathbone. During school, we all learn about John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated President Lincoln at the Ford's Theatre in Washington. But did you know that that wasn't the only tragedy to occur due to that night's events? In the theatre with Lincoln that night was his wife, along with Henry Rathbone, a military officer, and his girlfriend Clara. At the time of the assassination, Rathbone saw Booth and tried to save Lincoln, but Booth stabbed him before he could reach the president. Although he physically survived the attack, he left with a deep seated guilt about not being able to save the president's life. Two years went by, and and despite trying to move on from the tragedy by marrying Clara and starting a family, his mind never fully recovered and he became more and more paranoid about the world around him. He began claiming to hear voices speak to him from behind the walls that would taunt him endlessly, until eventually they pushed him towards complete breakdown. Convinced it was the only option, Rathbone shot and killed his wife before stabbing himself in an attempt to take his own. But just like before, he survived the attack on himself. Eventually he was tried for killing his wife and sent to live the rest of his life in an asylum. Coming in at number 6 is an animal trial. So not only did they have trials over the impotence of a man, believe it or not you could also take a literal animal to court in the middle ages. I kid you not. The whole kid and caboodle would be present, a judge, prosecutor, witnesses, a defense attorney. They truly took it very seriously. The reasoning behind it all I suppose was that at the time law prohibited punishment without trial. For for everything and everyone. The first recorded instance was the prosecution of a pig in France in 1266 accused of eating a young boy. The pig was found guilty for his crime and executed as punishment. If that doesn't sound crazy enough, keep in mind the judge would hold the behavior of the accused animal against it. And if the court didn't feel the animal was acting properly, that was taken into account. These trials were only put on against domestic animals as they truly believed having been in the company of humans, they should know how to act. Now, not all animals were executed for their crimes. Some lesser criminals were merely excommunicated from the church or cursed and sent to live in the wild. But it's still crazy. I mean, honestly, I wish I was making this up. Coming in at number five is John Scott Harrison. Raised by the ninth president of the US, William Henry, and the father of the 23rd president, Benjamin Harrison, although John Scott himself never rose to presidential ranks, he did did serve two years in Congress and was a prominent political figure in his time. But one day he decided politics wasn't really for him anymore and
and spent his last 20 years managing a farm in Ohio. After his death in 1878, his family gathered for the service and took great pains to protect his grave. At the time, grave robbing was at an all-time peak due to the demand for cadavers in medical schools. To avoid having his father be another subject of this, Benjamin had an unusually deep grave made and placed a massive stone that required 16 men to move placed on top of his casket. For extra measure, he then covered the whole ordeal in cement, then placed small wooden pegs below the surface of the covering so that he could tell if it had been disturbed. Oh, and he hired a security guard to watch it day and night for the next 30 days. After noticing a nearby family friend's grave had been exhumed, Benjamin and his nephew went to go and track it down. They managed to obtain a warrant for the Medical College of Ohio and with the help of a detective went to retrieve the corpse of their dear friend. When they arrived, they found a dissecting room on the top floor, but to their surprise, they couldn't find who they were looking for. Instead, they happened upon a body that looked strangely familiar, and when they removed the rags covering the head, they were horrified to discover it was the corpse of one Mr. John Scott Harrison. How the grave robber managed, we will never know. Next up at number four is La Costa. The Pax Romana is known for being one of the most peaceful times in history. The Romans had pretty much conquered what they set out to and so they began to, you know, just chill out for a bit. Then along came La Costa, esteemed maker of poisons and the world's first serial killer. Well, more like a hired assassin by the Roman Empire. Locusta was routinely caught poisoning people and despite frequent arrests for her killings, was always let free. Why is that? Well, the Empire got word and decided they could use her to their advantage. Her first big gig came from Empress Agrippina to kill her husband, Emperor Claudius. Locusta complied with glee and assassinated the Emperor. However, soon after, Agrippina threw her under the bus for the crime. But now, under the ruling of Lord Nero, he saved her for his own devilish plots. For the next 15 years under Nero, she worked consistently and was even awarded for her service. Locusta received a villa and even a small staff to help her in her poisonous endeavors. Nero even went as far to provide her with her own school for the profession. But after Nero was sentenced to death, Locusta lost her security blanket and lawful immunity and was executed by the emperor for her crimes. Coming in at number three is Gilles de Rey. Joan of Arc is rightfully so credited as a certified badass and patron saint who was a major defender of the French during the Hundred Years War. Among her most supportive and trusted allies was Gilles de Rey, an esteemed knight in the French army who was appointed the highest military distinction one could receive at the time. But if he was such a big deal and close companion of Joan, why isn't he as widely celebrated? Well, that's because sadly he was actually super evil. By day he was defending France beside Joan of Arc, but at night he was into the senseless killing of minors in occultist rituals. Often he would lure the unsuspecting victims in with psychological torture, convincing them that it was just a game before bludgeoning them and doing other cruel and unspeakable things to their corpses, supposedly using them for his rituals. Eventually, he was found out and tried for his crimes, admitting to all his vicious acts and hanged as punishment. Although no one knows for sure, it's suspected he had nearly 150 victims. Coming in at number two is virginity tests. Back in a time when a woman was merely the property of her husband, there was one very important thing that needed to be assured before the wedding night that she was pure. Mostly because it was believed that the consummation in fact kind of sealed the whole husband owning his wife deal, and if she had done it with anyone else, she didn't really belong to him. Charming. So to ensure that their potential wife was worth the dowry, suitors would perform virginity tests on their brides to be to make sure they weren't getting a secondhand woman, if you will. Such tests included inspecting their urine, as it was believed a virgin's urine would be clear. Other times they would give the woman a special potion, and if she could refrain from peeing, she was a virgin, as if a bladder was any indication of that. Sometimes a physician would be hired to inspect the woman's downstairs area, as they believed they could literally just tell by looking at it. Most common though was to inspect the sheets after the marriage was consummated. If there was blood, hooray, a virgin. If not, well then it was assumed she was a liar and her husband was legally entitled to compensation for being swindled into marrying her. And last up today are syphilis zombies. Sometimes it's easy to forget just how much antibiotics have changed the world around us. Well nowadays a shot of penicillin can keep
keep an early onset of the STI at bay, back in the day it could quite literally be the end of you. In fact, in 1494, Italy experienced one of the worst outbreaks in history, and if you didn't know any better, you might have thought it was a zombie apocalypse. Of course, before there was any kind of real understanding about how these types of diseases could be spread or caught, people were, let's just say, having a lot of fun with each other. But on the flip side of that, if they caught the infection, it would cause flesh to literally dissolve off their bodies until their inevitable death within a few months. It was also widely believed that bedding a virgin could cure you of the disease, so that's fun. Apparently, it was not uncommon to witness people missing hands, feet, eyes, noses, or look as if they'd been dropped into a vat of acid while walking down the street. Also remember that it took a few months before the disease actually killed them, so they were just living in excruciating pain while their flesh was slowly eaten away, in some cases right down to the bone. With that image in mind, it does make a little bit more sense as to why they believed you would go to hell for premarital relations. Like, I kind of get why they thought it was the devil punishing you for your sins. Thank God for antibiotics. <laughs> Starting us off at number 10, we have mummy unwrapping parties. So we already know that people love to do all kinds of weird and strange things with mummies back in the day. But after people widely stopped eating them or using their remains to make medicines, a new mummy trend began. After Napoleon's first expedition to Egypt in 1798, Europeans began to become even more more enthralled with mummies than they ever had been. In the 19th century, a mummy craze began. Travelers began bringing back whole mummies they had bought off the street in Egypt. And the next thing you know, they were no longer thought of having medicinal purposes, but rather being a wonderful party activity. Soon it became customary to hold mummy unwrapping parties, and wealthy Victorians would gather around as the host slowly unwrapped the dead body, showing off his wealth while simultaneously giving guests a thrilling evening filled with horror and delight. I have no clue what was done with the mummies after the public unboxing, but somehow I almost think it's better as, as I'm sure whatever happened next was even more disgusting. Number 9. Bomb Shadows We all likely know and were taught about the devastating bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki that killed 226,000 people in 1945. But one thing that you may not have learned about was what those bombs left behind. Behind. Apparently, as the attack was happening, the light and heat from the weapon was absorbed by the people and the objects in front of it. The surrounding light and heat then ended up bleaching the areas of the ground where nothing had been, leaving objects and people-shaped marks on the pavement. They became known as the Shadows of the Dead, and even now, after nearly 80 years, some of the shadows remain stained into the pavement and walls all over the city, as a reminder to the human capacity for destruction. Coming in at number 8, Vlad the Impaler. Born into a royal family in 1431, Vlad III was son of Vlad Dracul, the ruler of Wallachia at the time. During this time, Transylvania faced a lot of battles and bloodshed as the Ottoman Empire kept trying to push west towards Europe and the Christian Crusaders marched eastward towards the Holy Land. In 1442, Vlad Dracul was called to a diplomatic meeting with the Ottomans and brought with him his sons. But the meeting was a trap, and all three were arrested and held hostage. The father was granted to leave as long as he left his sons behind, and he agreed. So for the next few years, Vlad and his brother were trapped and tortured, although they did also strangely tutor the men in science, philosophy, and art, as well as turn them into warriors. Eventually, his brother and father both died, and Vlad was released. Soon after, he became the leader of Wallachia, and when the city of Constantinople fell to the Ottomans, Vlad led the force to defend his land from an invasion. It was during this time he became known as Vlad the Impaler, as he often used metal or wooden poles to impale invaders right through their chest, or sometimes he would even insert it vertically up the victim until it pierced through their shoulders, neck, or mouth. While well respected, he became notorious for killing thousands of people, and eventually became the inspiration 
for Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Count Dracula. Coming in at number 7, incubators. Nowadays, incubators are seen as life-saving devices for premature newborns, but shockingly, this was not always the attitude towards them. During the early 20th century, most physicians kind of held the belief that premature infants were not meant to survive, and so they were tragically just kind of left to die in most cases. But Martin Cooney held a different belief from his peers and wanted to try and change the narrative. But in order to do so, he had to make it a spectacle. One thing that people loved to do back in the day was gawk at the unusual, laugh at the different. And it's for that very reason that sideshows existed. So in order to save the lives of the preemies, Cooney decided to display them in what he called hatcheries as a sideshow in Coney Island. For a quarter, visitors could gaze upon the peculiar and small young people and over the years he managed to save more than 6,500 lives by packaging up their safety in a swallowable pill for the times he lived in. After so much success, doctors started coming around his ideas and now they are used by hospitals around the world. Next up at number 6, Pharaoh Pepe. Although the exact timeline is up for debate, somewhere around 2278 BC to 2216 BC, Pharaoh Pepe II reigned in Egypt. The ruler succeeded the throne at age 6 and became widely known as being one of Egypt's most demanding kings, which comes with little to no surprise that a literal first grader being given the power of a pharaoh affected his ego in a negative way. Often he demanded outlandish tasks of his slaves and subjects, but most strange of all was his practice to keep flies off of him. Apparently he hated flies more than anything in the world, so Pepe would force several slaves a day to be covered head to toe in honey and then stand naked by him in hopes to attract the bugs towards them and off himself. By the end of their days, his slaves would be covered in bites, boils, and sores caused by the countless insects that swarmed to them, and soon they would often succumb to diseases like malaria. Later on, flies actually became more or less a creature of high esteem for the Egyptians, becoming a symbol for persistence and tenacity, but for the near 90 year or so reign under Pepe, they were apparently the worst creature alive. Coming in at number 5, a cat phone. In 1929, a pair of scientists at Princeton University had a question. They wanted to test out how the auditory nerve perceives sound. But in order to test that, they had to find a subject. Now, as you can imagine, not too many people were lining up for this. So they ultimately decided to perform the experiment on a cat. The cat was heavily sedated prior to the operation, where the scientists cut out parts of its brain before attaching one end of a telephone wire into its auditory nerve and the other end into a receiver. Shockingly, the cat survived the operation and the scientists went forward with their experiment. To their delight, they discovered that if you spoke into the cat's ear, you could hear it perfectly through the receiver. But their initial success was not enough for them. Next, they had to know if it worked once the cat was dead. So they killed the cat to test their theory, but sadly the cat phone no longer functioned without access to a functional brain. Despite its rather gruesome story, the two did actually contribute to a valuable understanding of the brain and helped future researchers in development of cochlear implants. So at least it wasn't all in vain. Coming in at number 4, death photography. Memento mori means remember you must die. For centuries, trinkets were used to keep the thought of death close and to help the living through their grieving process. In Victorian times, this looked like lockets filled with hair of the dead, a mask of your loved one created out of wax, or by having paintings and sculptures made in their memory. But all of a sudden, a new invention came along that led to creating an all new kind of memento mori, the photograph. As its popularity increased, the price of having your photo taken was all of a sudden cheaper than a portrait, and many began using this new technology to keep the essence of their loved ones preserved forever. Next thing you know, families are getting photos taken with their dead family members, and for many, it was even the first time getting a photo taken. The dead were sometimes propped up to look alive, while other times eyeballs were painted on after it developed to give them a more lifelike look. The pictures would be hung in the house just like any normal family portrait, and served as a reminder to the family of the ones they lost. Thankfully, the practice went out of style as healthcare began began to improve and less people were dying so young. Coming in at number 3, gibbeting. 
During medieval times, the practice of execution was really just an average Tuesday afternoon, and even darker was that it was pretty common practice for criminals to be left on the gallows after they were hanged, as sort of a warning sign to the others in the town. But another form of torturous death they made criminals endure was called gibbeting. The ancient practice consisted of humiliating and hanging a criminal from a large post, but unlike being hanged, the convict was stuffed inside a small cage that was left dangling in the air. The victim would be put in the cage completely alive and essentially left to rot, while people of the town gathered round to witness the spectacle, often even torturing the criminal in their own ways. Eventually, after starvation, cold, and muscle atrophy, they would die and their rotting bodies would be left inside the hanging cage for weeks, sometimes even years, until nothing but their skeletons remained inside. Eventually, the practice was outlawed by the mid-1800s, but some say that if you walk past an old gibbeting cage, you can still hear the screams of the soul who died inside. Coming in at number two, chats with a severed head. In the early 1900s, a French physician named Gabriel Baudieu was interested in exploring the connection between mind, brain, and body. So in 1905, when the execution of Henri Langui was announced, he rushed to the guillotine to study the aftermath. Baudieu claimed that after the guillotine dropped and the head fell to the ground, he called out to the victim and the severed head allegedly blinked his eyes as if awakening. He wrote, the eyelids lifted up, this time I swear, in a distinctly normal movement, slow as if awakening or torn from thought. He further detailed that the pupils focused in on him until slowly the eyelids faded closed. But once again, he called the man's name and his eyes opened. Some believe that it was simply leftover nerve impulses, but Gabriel swore that the head could hear him and understand him. He said he felt something looking into his eyes and knew it wasn't just a coincidence. And last up today, the Leningrad famine. For 872 days, the people of Leningrad suffered one of the most destructive military blockades in history. In just a little less than three years, the population dropped from 2.5 million to just 800,000. In September of 1941, they were bombarded by the Axis powers and cut off from the outside world, receiving no wood, no gas, no coal, and no food. And it only got worse once winter hit. Soon they were trying to stay alive with no food in negative 40 degree temperatures, and so many resorted to burning their possessions just to evade death one more day. But as time went on, it only got darker and darker. People would leave their homes and never return. At first, many assumed they died in the cold, but suddenly it was happening more and more frequently. It didn't take too long to draw a connection to the mysterious disappearances, as the next day there would magically be meat available at the market, usually labeled as horse or dog. Soon after, people began killing firsthand, just to feed themselves, and some were even driven to kill their own families just to survive. Officially, there are 2,000 recorded cases of eating human flesh, but it's believed to be much higher. All the while, of course, the elite hoarded food that came into the city via the lakes and never once went hungry. There are journal recordings from the same time about eating goose and caviar at a party while the commoners froze to death in the streets. Starting off at number 10, vampire killings. So starting us off, we have the supposed vampire killings from the 1800s. Now, spoiler alert here, they weren't actually vampires. Well, I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they weren't. Anyways, back in the 1800s, people in New England believed that cadavers were rising from their graves at night and preying on the living. So to solve this problem, they began exhuming the cadavers. Now, some kept it simple and just turned the cadaver face down, but others jumped to more extreme methods like ripping the bones apart and rearranging them, or burning the deceased person's heart and inhaling the smoke. 
Apparently at the time, it was believed inhaling the smoke cured tuberculosis, though I can only imagine it made matters much worse for them. Some towns were so into the ritual that they would even hold festivals during the process and celebrate the exhumation and subsequent destruction of the corpses altogether. So while it was incredibly unsettling, they did truly believe they were vampires haunting them in the night, so I guess it gave them some peace of mind. Next up at number 9, dentures. While today dentures are made from composite resin or sometimes porcelain, during the 18th and 19th centuries of course those materials weren't available. But as you can imagine, people were still losing teeth at an even higher rate due to the high sugar diet, attempted teeth whitening which was really just wearing away their enamel instead of brightening it, and the overall lack of knowledge around hygiene. So dentures were still needed and wanted by many. So what was their material of choice? Well, for the easiest and most profitable route, many would acquire the teeth from dead bodies. Although if you had some money, you might be able to afford dentures made from ivory. Other materials were sometimes the teeth of animals or wood, but honestly, I think we can all agree that none of those sound like terribly sanitary options, considering professional physicians at the time weren't sterilizing instruments and some didn't even believe in disinfecting prior to surgery. Next up at number 8, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process of creating the beautifully colored glass, and as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So quite literally, some of those old stained glass windows were painted with pea paint, which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest. Honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Coming in at number 7, leather bound books. Nowadays it's unusual to even find real leather on anything, but once upon a time the leather on books wasn't even from cows, it was from people. Called anthropodermic bibliopegy, the books were made in a similar way as they would now, but obviously with one huge difference. They used human skin instead of an animal. While there are actually only 18 confirmed books of its kind that still exist, we have no idea just how many there could have been all those years ago. Allegedly the books were usually made from executed convicts, and during the French Revolution there were rumors that a tannery for human human skin was established outside of Paris. I mean it kind of gives me the willies to think about it and I'm just glad we've moved on to a different material to bind our books today. Next up at number 6, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident, but two years later the same thing happened again. Now with two miners perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two miners were as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5, Radiation Test Subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, 
after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co-workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank. And as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for 83 days, Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which, I mean, in their defense was the request of the family, but still, he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his torture. Coming in at number four, Mamiya. Most widely practiced between the 12th to the 17th century, although there were a few cases in the 18th century that pop up, Mamiya was widely used as a means of medicine in many European countries. Now, if you can't tell by the name, Mamiya is creepily just as it sounds, the use of human remains to fix a living person's ailments. It was believed by many of the top physicians at the time that ingesting certain remains prompted the medicinal power of the mummy and could cure things like coagulated blood, pain, coughs, inflammation, cramps, and even heal open wounds. Now, they didn't just sit around eating the carcass directly. Instead, they would either grind the bones into a powder and drink it from there, or drink an extracted liquid from the embalmed individual. In fact, it was so popular at one point that it's believed the reason there are so few mummies these days is because of the high demand of flesh at the time. Coming in at number three, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo, and while there, he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently, Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. <laughs> According to Assad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl killed. What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened, which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number two, Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of genocide in history, with nearly two million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving, and anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people People became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic, turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities, and the people are freed from the genocidal regime. And 
last up in our number one spot, the rabbit woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England, as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right. But still, the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently, Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried, and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first, everyone actually believed her, as in fact, a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king's surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually, Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud, and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. Mm -hmm. 